Okay, so just quick rundown of this here, just so everybody's clear and just to see if anybody has any further questions, right? So for Wednesday, you're finishing Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. The paper two proposal is gonna be due, 500 words, right? You're gonna submit all of your questions for the review session via email by Thursday morning. So <clears throat> then I will make the recording on Friday and post it. It should be up by Friday evening. Um, if you haven't done so already, please complete the course evaluation. And if you could upload all of your world building materials to the folder on Georgia View. So does anybody have any questions about anything? Have questions to email you? Then don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, the uh, the review session is really just like for your benefit. To, um, you know, if there if there's anything like that you're unclear on, right? So just you know, go over the vocab terms, go over the sample questions that I gave you, and if they generate any questions, right? If there's something that you're confused about or something that you want more information about, or that you just don't remember, right? Shoot me an email and I'll answer it in the video. And you'll be submitting it to everybody just in case we do have questions? Yeah, everybody will be, everybody will have access to the video. Okay. Just in case. Chris. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your video is going to be posting it? What? Pardon? For when you go over the review, you're going to video it and post it? So just... Exactly, yeah. That, that's instead of, instead of us meeting physically today, since I, I seem to recall that. Agreeing on a time for that was, was difficult. So that way, if somebody can't make it, they can still have it. Well, none of you actually have to make it. <laughs> I can just record something, and, um, and we'll have it. OK, so any other questions about anything going forward? Then I believe Ashlyn has something for us. Yep. All right. I did not draw because I did not draw to save my life. But I did um, pick it all up. So um, in Kathy's world, she has three tribes. So okay. I have divided the physical appearance up into three parts. Uh -huh. So with the witches, um, they do not keep the same physical appearance. In the morning, they are young. In the afternoon, they are middle-aged. And in the evening, they are crones. Nice. I've modeled this after the triple-faced goddess found in many mythologies. Mm -hmm. The witches themselves are divided into two groups, the ones that have the ability to freeze things and the ones that have powers to control plants and animals. Kathy mentioned that when there's discourse, the, the ice witches will freeze uh -huh. the water from Carrington's Island. Okay. And there are also witches who have uh, power over plants nature. Okay. The ice witches have blonde hair, ice blue eyes, and a variety of skin tones. They wear fur and animal skin that the earth witches have made from animals that have died, as well as boots. The earth witches have either dark colored hair, brown or green eyes, and a variety of skin colors, although even the palace of these witches has a golden glow. The earth witches wear loose tunics and capris made from cotton and go barefoot. Uh, the blue faced monks have blue faces, a variety of different eye colors, and all the monks keep their heads cleanly shaved to show more of their blue skin. The monks all wear blue dyed tunics with loose blue pants under the tunic and cloth slippers. Each monk has a leather cord with a single emeraldian dragon scale, and there uh -huh. are not any female monks. Okay, so is the inspiration for that more the Smurfs or the Blue Man group? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Kathy just said that the monks have blue skin. Okay, so they're just... made from like an explosion that happened. Okay, so, so you just went, just went with that. Yeah. All right. We can go blue man groups. <laughs> or Avatar. Or Avatar. <laughs> and then um, the final group is the shapeshifters. All shapeshifters have an olive skin tone and dark hair and eyes. Uh -huh. The female shifters wear loose dresses that are easy to change in and out of depending on what shape they shift to. The male shifters wear loose pants with a pouch on their backs. All the shifters wear a totem with their main uh, spirit on them. And all shifters walk barefoot but will put on sandals when meeting with other groups. Um, the level of technology, they've reached the Iron Age. 
of history. Okay. Um, there are the necessary tools and knowledge to harvest, uh, harvest the special grapes, basic agriculture, and for the monks to be able to forge the dragon scales. Uh -huh. The only weapons are the tools you, uh, they don't really even have weapons, but if they needed them, they would just only have their own. Uh -huh. Tools for farming, harvesting animal parts, and forging other tools. Okay. The political system is that each group sends one representative to discuss how the island should function and handle any problems that may arise within and outside the island. Within each group, they have open discussions among themselves before the representative is sent to meet with the others. To be able to participate in these discussions and be a representative, a person has to be at least 25 years old because that's when your frontal plan is fully developed. Okay. <laughs> uh, each person has to serve as a representative, representative at least once in their life, but no more than five times in order to allow everyone a fair chance. At the, at the meetings, no weapons are allowed and no magic is permitted. Okay. Um, the islands a matriarchal society, being that the women govern every major aspect of the island. In the beginning, the men of the island and the monks were in control. Uh, during this time, there was a lot of fighting within the island as well as fighting with other regions. I was watching um, the Great Claw wrote this, so um, <laughs> had a theory going on. Uh huh. Okay. The men were uh, greedy with the knowledge of the dragon scales. Uh, women stepped up and offered the men the choice of a peaceful transition, or they would begin withholding access to resources such as food and clean water. Once the women took over, the men still had power, but in a limited manner. The family structure also shifted to a matriarchal line, where the family trees would follow through the women. The men are welcome to take their wife's last name, keep their own, or to hyphenate. Everyone shares the domestic chores and the harder labor intensive jobs. Childcare is also split evenly, with the men being able to stay with their wives while they would cover. There's not a traditional idea of family. Family is not necessarily biologically played, but who a person chooses. Okay. Um, moral vows are pretty basic. They believe in doing no harm, but not being take, taken advantage of. No one takes more than they need and makes sure to replace what they do use. All the groups respect each other's property and do not cross into another's property without explicit consent. Lying slash false accu accusations are heavily frowned upon. Um, Saying the thing that is not, yeah. yeah. Uh, religion, all of the groups worship nature in some form or another. They're extremely respective. They don't take any more than they need and they replace what they do use. They don't have a specific name for the religion, just that they are, try extremely hard to be respectful of nature. Okay. Um, those who take more than they need or are disrespectful or exiled. And the economic activity, all the groups trade among themselves, mainly in knowledge. This community trades with the other regions, mainly in agriculture and the occasional dragon scale. The monks and witches teach members of the other regions better ways to care for their animals and their farming land. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Interesting stuff to work with there. All right. So, uh, with that out of the way, uh, let's get back to Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. So, what I've put up on the board here are a couple of things that have been kind of boiling throughout the novel here that we haven't really had a lot of time to discuss, but that we might want to draw out. So um, I don't have any particular planned focus today. We can talk about any of these things or something else. Um, Mostly, I, I kind of want to know like what you guys would like to explore a little bit more. Can we go back and talk about some of the vocabulary? Because some for, of them I was not here to see. No, for I mean for Jonathan Strange and Mr. Normal. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, King's Kingship and Madness. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's go ahead and start there. So let's start with the whole madness thing, right? So what do we remember about one of the big distinctions between neoclassicism and romanticism? One promotes creativity and imagination, the other don't. The other the other's restricted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the other's like restricted with rules and structure. 
that was the same as the one, the same kind that was used by ancient Greeks and Romans. Sure, and I think it, it's not so much that neoclassicism discourages creativity as such, right? But it tries to place creativity within particular rational bounds, right? So neoclassicism, I think it's probably a good idea for us to think about as a phenomenon of what we call the age of reason. Or the enlightenment. And so what do you all know about uh, the age of reason and the enlightenment from other, maybe from other classes? Um, it's when ideas about how the world should or at least how society should be governed. Um, that there should be more of a democracy versus just the aristocracy having all the power in the state. Um, there was also movements in science. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, had Isaac Newton with his laws. There were more, there was more, it shifted from more of a focus on religion and more of a focus on why and how. Okay, yeah, so I, I think it, like, yeah, you're, you're moving in the, the right directions for thinking about the novel, I think, here, right? That in particular, when you talk about something like Newton or somebody like Newton, right? Is it like a rationalized thought? Yeah, yeah, the, 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 this, yeah um, the, this idea that one of the things that distinguishes human beings from other creatures, right, is our capacity for reason or rationality which is a return to certain Greek philosophical idea, ideas, right? Um, but, um, yeah, um, and not only are human beings gifted with reason, but according to a number of philosophers and scientists in this period, right, particularly those who adopt a philosophical system called rationalism, so in this case, think about people like uh, Isaac Newton and Rene Descartes. The world operates according to predictable, observable patterns, right? Once you know the laws that govern the movements of the universe, right? You can predict pretty accurately exactly how they're going to go, what they're going to do, right? So if you can measure, for example, the Earth's orbit around the sun, you can assume that it's always going to be about the same length. And if it does change, it's going to change according to a predictable measure, right? That say if, if you know the orbit does seem to stretch out a little bit, it's going to stretch in increments following particular mathematical laws, right? So in the same period when neoclassicism is the primary um, literary mode in England and in France in particular, um, we're also getting a lot of this kind of very mathematical thinking about the way the universe works, right? that everything works according to um, laws and principles, most of which can be attached to certain mathematical equations. Now, <clears throat> romanticism is, I would argue, a little bit more closely associated with specifically English philosophical movements like empiricism and associationism. Which are very, uh, they're similar to each other. Associationism is a kind of uh, development of empiricism. Does anybody know what empiricism, I think we may have talked about empiricism in this class before. I know if you took Brit Lit 2 with me, we probably talked about it. Does anybody, rem does anybody know what this means, an what an empiricist believes? Your sense of impression is dictating how you understand the world. Exactly. Our own, an, an empiricist believes that we gain knowledge of the world through sense impressions. 
And the only things that we can know for sure are the things that are the things that we gather through our senses. Um, so this actually goes in some weird and interesting directions. Uh, the Irish philosopher George Berkeley, for example, argues that um, nothing exists outside of our sense impressions, and that if we're not actually sensing a thing actively at the moment, we can't be certain that it exists. He gets around this by saying that everything exists in the mind of God, but um, it seems like kind of a dodge, right? He, he kind of backs away from kind of the more disturbing implications of his theory. Now, David Hume, who's a little later than Barclay, doesn't back away from any of these implications and says that the only thing that we can be certain of at all is what we are directly sensing right now at this moment, right? That we tend to confuse our experience with immutable laws of the universe. For example, as regards the orbit of the sun, right? Hume argues that the only reason we assume that the sun, that it's, that it's some kind of natural law, that the sun will always rise in the east and set in the west, is because it always has. There is, not, there is no particular reason why it should always do that. So, <clears throat> empiricists, and so associationists then believe that we kind of form our view of the world by putting together sense impressions, right? Very similar to um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's theory of the imagination that we talked about last time, right? So, Norrell's way of doing magic is very much in this kind of rationalist mode, right? He loves lists, he loves charts, he loves categories. Um, <clears throat> he likes pulling things out of books. Whereas Strange's means of doing magic is much more in this kind of associationist mode. Now this associationist mode is associated not just with Strange, but I would argue also with fairies. And not just because the Romantics were particularly interested in fairy lore and folk tales and things like that, right? Does anybody remember something that we're told specifically in a footnote about the difference between human beings and fairies? Let's see if I can remember where it is and try to find it. Let's uh, start by thinking about the gentleman with the thistle down hair as our primary example here of a fairy, right? And how does the gentleman appear to us? His general kind of like demeanor, um, attitude, level of sanity. Kind of like. 
What do you make of his personality? Yeah, his Latin is better than normal's, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that yeah, he speaks dead languages fluently. And why is he so excited at the sight of Miss Wintertown and later Lady Pole? What's his plan for her? Still in life. Yeah, she has to spend half of her life with him, right? But because Norrell doesn't specify in the deal exactly which half, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of simply like you know giving her like allotting her say seventy-five years of life and then you know cutting her down at age thirty-eight or whatever, right? Instead, what the gentleman with thistle down hair does is take every night from her. Right, so she has to dance at his balls every night. And her finger. And he, yes, and he also uh, takes, her, takes her little finger as a token, right? So. You're crafty. What's that? They're crafty and they look for loopholes. Okay, yeah, yeah, he's crafty, he looks for, looks for loopholes. Why does he want Lady Pole in the first place? The answer is actually pretty simple. Why does he want her at his balls? Yeah, because she's beautiful, right? He collects pretty things. Yeah, he, he's a collector. Fairy King. Yeah. From uh, Mr. Garland. From what? Mr. Garland and Green Eyes. Well, you're thinking of Sir Ophelia. Yeah, Sir yeah. Ophelia. But this is actually, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you two will remember Sir Ophelia, Sir Ophelia from last semester. It's a, a medieval. Uh, short romance that's based on the Orpheus myth, right? Where, yeah, the, the fairy king is a collector of people, really, right? You know, in particular, of yeah, beautiful people. Right, and, you know, we see the gentleman has the same sort of attitude towards, um, towards Stephen, right? He wants Stephen in his collection as well, and is promising to make him a king, um, but um, also has this interest in Arabella Strange. Why doesn't he have an official name? What's that? Why does, does he not have an official name? This, he's always referred to as the gentleman with thistle down hair. That's sketchy. If he, yeah, um, no, no one seems to know what his name is, right? And again, think about this in terms of folklore regarding names, right? Yeah, names give you power over a thing, right? I think it's also probably worth noting that Stephen and the Raven King are also technically nameless, right? Or at least, you know, whatever name they were, whatever names they were given at birth are unknown. All right, John Uskglass is a, an alias that's given later, right? But the reason I draw this out is the gentleman with thistle down hair is himself a king, right? So he's king. of this fairy kingdom called Lost Hope. Right, and there's a, a bell tower um, 
in a kind of ruined, desolate landscape. Um, and I want to um, just take a minute and note uh, some of the things that he tells Stephen, who he takes a great liking to, about the history of his kingdom. For a second here at page um, one eighty eight, where the gentleman is looking for a kingdom with which to reward Stephen, right? He wants to make he wants to make Stephen into a king. Right? He said he resumed his extravagant praises of Stephen's beauty, dignified countenance, and excellent dancing, all of which he seemed to consider the chief qualifications for the ruler of a vast kingdom in fairy. And he began to speculate upon which kingdom would suit Stephen best. Untold blessings is a fine place, with dark and penetrable forests, lonely mountains, and uncrossable seas. It has the advantage of being without a ruler at present. But then it has the disadvantage that there are 26 other claimants already, and you would be plunged straight away into the middle of a bloody civil war, which perhaps you would not care for? Then there is the dukedom of pity me. The present duke has no friends to speak of. Oh, but I could not bear to see any friend of mine ruler of such a miserable little place as pity me. So, What does the gentleman seem to regard as the primary attributes of kingship? Beauty, dancing, and a unified countenance. Yeah. So, kingship for a fairy, right, has nothing whatsoever to do with any kind of rational ability to rule, right? It's entirely tied up in how kingly you look and how gracefully and how dignified you behave, right? So fairies, I found, by the way, the um, passage I was looking for is on page um, 253, footnote there. Can I get somebody to read the bottom? There says Richard Chaston, 1620 to 1695. Richard Chaston, 1620 to 95. Chaston wrote that men and fairies both contain within them a faculty of reason and a faculty of magic. And men makes it strong and magic is weak. With fairies, it is the other way around. Magic comes very naturally to them, but by human standards, they are barely sane. Okay, good. So what does that suggest magic is more associated with? Insanity. Yeah, that magic is more associated with the irrational and with unreason, right? Then with reason. Which means that at least according to the traditions of English magic, Norrell's style of magic is something kind of new and out of the ordinary. Right? Norrell's modern magic that he claims is based on systems and principles is kind of intensely rational. It's, you know, you acquire it through diligence and study. At least you would if you would let anybody else actually do that. Um, and it's based on orderly, predictable principles to produce orderly, predictable effects. Now, what does all this have to do with kingship? Well, the period in English history in which the novel takes place is referred to as the Regency.
Does anybody know why the period between 1811 and 1820 was called the Regency? What's a regent? Someone who rules in place of the actual ruler. Yeah, someone who rules in place of the actual king, right? This is because King George was mad. Exactly, yes. This was the period of King George III's last insanity, right? And he, you know, by this point, he was completely kind of incapacitated. So his eldest son, who in 1820 would take the throne as George IV, reigned as Prince Regent during this time. So let's look at Strange's encounter with the king. Right, so first off, we'll, we get an account of the king's situation. Right, if you look on page 369, can I get somebody to read um, the paragraph that starts with the Willises were two brothers? The Willises were two brothers who owned a madhouse in Lincolnshire. For many years now they had attended the king whenever his majesty had happened to become mad. And whenever he had happened to be in his right mind, the king had repeatedly told everyone how much he hated the Willises and how deeply he resented their cruel treatment of him. He had extracted promises from the queen and the dukes and the princesses that should he ever become mad again, they would not surrender him to the Willises. But it had done no good. At the first sign of delirium, the Willises had been sent for, and they had come immediately and locked the king in a room and clapped him in, into a straight waistcoat and given him strong, purging medicines. Okay, thank you. So, what's weird about the treatment of the king here? He's not being treated like a king. Yeah, he's being treated as completely without any agency here, right? Mm -hmm. He tells them how much he hates the Willises and how he, I'm afraid he is the Willises, right? But every time he starts to go a little funny again, the first thing the family does is call the Willises, right? So the king, right, apart from, you know, rather than being, you know, the king of one of the most powerful nations on earth, right, is entirely without power to order his own life. Or even express his own preferences, right? What else do we know about the king's condition when Strange gets to him, right? What else do we learn about the king? You can see the gentleman. Yeah, the king can see the gentleman with thistle down hair. Or at least can sense him, because can the king actually see anything physically? No, he's blind. He's blind, yeah, he's also blind. But he knows somebody's there with strange, right? So. whether he can sense the gentleman because he's mad or can sense the gentleman because he's a king, right? I'm not sure which is which here, right? You know, probably some sort of combination of both. What's that? To be king is to be mad. Well, plenty of people have been kings who weren't mad, right? In, well, arguably. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something, it's common in fantasy to make the, not just the king, but who, the ruler uh -huh. slightly mad. Sure. And I think one of the things that this novel is also kind of bound to, right, in choosing a real historical setting and real historical personages like George III, right, is that it has to at least acknowledge the real history of these people, right? That you know, for the, you know, yes, George the Third was 
out of his board from 1811 to 1820, right? That's probably not the most sensitive way to express it, but. <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, yeah, the, 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 the king genu genuinely was mentally incapacitated, right? But <clears throat> this mental incapacity seems to bring him closer to the world of magic. And you know, the other king that we see mentioned most frequently throughout the novel, right, is a magician king who was raised by fairies. Right, and there's a mural depicting the Raven King in the king's private quarters in Windsor Castle, right? If you look on page uh, 372, um, can I get somebody to first read the, um, the paragraph that starts with tall arched windows along the south wall? <clears throat> tall arched windows along the south wall let, it, let in the cold, misty light. The lower part of the walls was paneled with wood and the panels all had carved and gilded borders. The upper part of the walls and ceiling were covered with paintings of gods and goddesses, kings and queens. The ceiling shewed Charles II in the process of being carried up to eternal glory upon a white and blue cloud. Surrounded by fat pink cherubs, generals and diplomats laid trophies at his feet, while Julius Caesar, Mars, Hercules, and various important personages stood about in some embarrassment, having been suddenly struck with the mortifying consciousness of their inferiority to the British gay. Okay, so let's first unpack this portrait of Charles II, right? What are the, apart from the king himself, what are the other features of this portrait? The gods Caesar, deciding. Caesar, Mars, and Hercules. Yes, we've got these figures from Greek and Roman mythology and history, right? All looking kind of abashed and ashamed at how big and powerful this king is, right? As Charles II is being lifted up into heaven, right? No doubt in one of those great big gigantic curly wigs. Now let's look at the paragraph that follows here. Um, the other mural that's in Windsor Castle. Can I get somebody to read for us starting with all of this was most magnificent? All of this was most magnificent, but the painting which caught Strange's eye was a huge mural that stretched the entire length of the north wall. In the middle were two kings seated upon two thrones. On each side, or stood or knelt knights, ladies, courtiers, pages, gods, and goddesses. The left-hand part of the painting was steeped in sunlight. The king upon this side was a strong, handsome man who displayed all the vigor of youth. He was dressed in a pale robe, and his hair was golden and curling. There was a laurel wreath upon his brow and a scepter in his hand. The people and gods who attended him were all equipped with helmets, breastplates, spears, and swords as if the artist wished to suggest that this king only attracted the most warlike of men and gods to be his friends. In the right hand in the part of the painting, the light grew dim and dusky, as if the artist meant to depict a summer's twilight. Stars shone above and around the figures. The king on his side was, on this side was pale-skinned and dark hair. He wore a black robe, and his expression was unfathomable. He had a crown of dark ivy leaves, and in his left hand he held a slim ivory wand. His entourage was composed largely of magical creatures, a phoenix, a unicorn, a manticore, fawns, and satyrs. But there were also some mysterious persons, a male figure in a monk-like robe with his hood pulled down over his face, a female figure in a dark, starry mantle with her arm thrown over her eyes. Between the two thrones stood a young woman in a loose white robe with a golden helmet upon her head. The warlike king had placed his left hand protectively upon her shoulder the dark king held out his right hand towards her, and she, and she ex had extended her, her hands to his so that their fingertips lightly touched. Okay, thank you. 
So what's different about the second painting? It's like in dark. Okay. Two kings. Yeah, two courts. yeah, exactly. The Charles the Second. It's just light, right? Only light. And there's one king, one court. Now Charles ruled. I forget the exact dates of his reign, but in the late seventeenth and early 18th centuries. So on the one hand, kind of concurrent with the rise of neoclassicism and the age of reason. Um, but also in a period that was called the Restoration. Because the monarchy was restored after Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth fell, right? So we have here the restoration of English kingship. But this also seems to be around the same time that the novel seems to believe that magic completely disappeared from England, right? But then this other mural, yeah, shows Edward III Actually, no, the no, uh, no, um, no, he wasn't. The, the Black Prince was his oldest son, and the Black Prince didn't live. It's not that the, the Black Prince didn't live to be an old man. It's just that his father lived even longer. Um, so yeah, so he did not. Um, the Black Prince did not inherit his father's throne, and instead, his his own his son was the next heir, Richard II. But anywho, sorry, that's okay. Yeah, the second mural is, yeah, Edward III and the Raven came together. So light and dark. And what ideas seem to be associated with, with south and north here? Like, what sorts of ideas do we see associated with Edward III, for example? Protection. Yeah. Victory. Pardon? Victory. Yeah, protection, victory, right, military might, right? What ideas seem to be associated then with the Raven King, with John Usglass of the North? It's giving me that uh, Devil and Eve vibe. Okay, yeah, yeah. Which would be the, the light touch of the fingers instead of the uh, protectively grabbing the shoulder. Yeah, there's a kind of invitation or temptation there, yeah, rather than. And Edward wears laurel, a laurel wreath. And the Raven King wears dark ivy leaves. Yeah, and we've noted uh, before that ivy is associated specifically with magicians, or that English magicians um, wear ivy crowns, rather than the you know rather than the traditional uh, Greco-Roman laurel crown that's given to a victor, right? But yeah, so it's we've got here yeah kind of two models of kingship here, right? One, which places its hand protectively on Britannia's shoulder, like, you're mine, right? And another, that's just kind of trying to gently invite her into a clearly completely different world, right? Yeah, go ahead. Say late 17th to early 18th? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I think, like, you know, this is kind of not unlike the way fairy folklore often works, right? You know, how the fairy king doesn't usually directly kidnap so much, just kind of invite them into his realm and then just not let them leave, right? Um, unless certain strange conditions are met. But yeah, the, yeah, the Raven King is like depicted here as almost kind of inviting Britain into 
a complete, like a kind of alternative to traditional history, right? That traditional British history of conquest and military might um, and, you know, knightly glory. It's like, no, we got magic too, right? This is the other side of it. Yeah, <laughs> and manticores, right? And all of these impossible creatures. The dark king held out his right hand towards her and she extended her hand to his so that their fingertips lightly touched, right? And I think it's important here too that Britannia is not reaching back towards the king of the south, right? Towards Edward III. She's only reaching towards Jono's glass, right? It mentions this, um... Magic is sexier. Go ahead, yeah. Join the dark side, there's magic. <laughs> um, and then it's, we know who Britannia is, the woman in the middle, but then uh -huh. this also mentions a uh, male figure in a monk-like robe with his hood pulled down over his face. Yeah. What is that supposed to be, death? Well, you know, I'm not... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest, I'm not sure. I mean, like, the best I can come up with for these other two figures is that they're fairies. Maybe the monk like figures, the man with this one down here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he certainly seems to be ancient, right? I mean, there's, there's a, a point at which um, he greets Stephen at, uh, at the club. And let me see if I can find that. And he's eating a bizarre feast. He's feasting on, like, uh, like the only thing that um, Stephen recognizes that he's feasting on is pork. Um, but even, like, like, the pork is, like, made from ghost pigs or something. So, uh, page uh, 500. <clears throat> Can I get somebody to read the paragraph that starts with, oh, that is because I've ordered an exact copy of a meal. Wyvern. A wyvern is like a two-legged dragon. Oh. And a pie of honeyed hummingbirds. Here is roasted salamander with a relish of pomegranates. Here a delicate fricasse of the combs of cockatrices, cockatrices mm -hmm. spiced with saffron and powdered rainbows, and ornamented with gold stars. Now sit you down and eat. That will be the best cure for your dizziness. What will you take? So this feast that the man, the gentleman is eating, right? You know, wyvern, salamander. And in this case, like, it's not talking about salamander like the little lizard, right? Salamander like 
the uh, fire creature, right? Yeah. Cockatrice, powdered rainbow, and ornamented gold stars, right? Very heavy alchemy symbols. Uh huh. And magical creatures. And it's basically, by the standards of Regency era England, an impossible feast, right? There's no way this guy could possibly order this up in a restaurant and have this arrive. But when did he say he last ate this? Four or five hundred years ago. Yeah, when John Usglass was still ruling northern England, right? So this is a reference to England's magical past, right? And a kind of premonition that this magical past is on its way back, right? Now, I do want to try to link this up with the way women are portrayed in the text and also um, with Stephen Black and his situation because those are all very much tied up with the gentleman with the thistle down hair and his strange tastes and the strange attitudes, right? So let's start with Arabella Strange who disappears near the end of the section that we were to, re to read for today, uh, presumed dead. What does Arabella's relationship with her husband seem to be like? I met a lot of women at the time. Okay. <laughs> how so? How so? Well, he wants to go and shoot draw light, and she talks him out of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's one one thing, right? Yeah, she talks him out of dueling with draw light. Okay. He actually like that, and Strange actually talks to her and about magic. Okay. Instead of like, oh, that's men's work. Mm -hmm. Your poor, delicate, feminine sensibilities cannot handle it. Okay. So he treats her almost like an equal. Almost, almost right? Like almost. When he first encounters Vinculus in the hedge and is thinking about whether or not to protect this person from the villagers, why does he go ahead and decide to protect Vinculus? Is it because he thinks that very street magicians from London need particular protection? Who does he think wouldn't approve if he didn't protect Vinculus? Yeah, he's on his way to see Arabella, right? And he's thinking of her when he decides to, to defend Vinculus, right? She's also um, the reason why he doesn't go off wandering these roads he finds behind the mirrors, right? Even after her, her apparent death, because he promised her he wouldn't, he does not do so. One more thing I want to point to after she's gone as well. This, the general state of Strange's home when Sir Walter and Lord Portishead come to visit him.
page 589, right, first paragraph. A few days after the visit to the engraver, Strange invited Sir Walter and Lord Portishead to dinner. Both gentlemen had dined with Strange upon many occasions, but this was the first time they had entered the house in Soho Square since the death of Mrs. Strange. They found it sadly changed. Strange seemed to have reverted to all his old bachelor habits. Tables and chairs were fast disappearing under piles of papers. Half-finished chapters of his book were to be found in every part of the house, and in the drawing room he had even taken to making notes upon the wallpaper. So what happens to the state of the house when she's gone? It goes downhill quick. Yeah. So let's kind of think about this in terms of 19th century literary patterns. What does Arabella kind of look like? Again, in terms of kind of purely literary, think Victorian tropes, right? Angel in the house. Yeah. Good. After the angel in the house becomes the wild fairy being outside the house, this moral center of Strange's universe tends to trust, starts to fall apart, right? But yeah, Arabella, at least for the first half of the novel or so, seems to exist mostly to rein in a lot of her husband's more destructive tendencies, right, or self-destructive tendencies, right? Rather like the 19th century angel in the house was supposed to exist not for her own sake, but for other people's, right? We see the same kind of ideology at work uh, with the, uh, the gray seals whom um, Strange meets in Italy. If you look on page 620, we have young Miss Grace Steele walking with her aunt, right? You know, it's a very odd thing, my dear, but when we were just in the, just in the church, with, while you and Mr. Strange were looking at the pictures, I just popped my head out of the door, and I thought then that it was raining, and I was very much afraid to see that you would get wet. No, aunt, see, the stones are perfectly dry. There's not a spot of rain upon them. Well then, my dear, I hope that you are not inconvenienced by this wind. It is a little sharp about the ears. We can always ask Mr. Strange and Papa to walk a little faster if you do not like it. Thank you, Aunt, but I am perfectly comfortable. I like this breeze. I like the smell of the sea. It clears the brain, the senses, everything. But perhaps, Aunt, you do not like it. Oh, no, my dear. I never mind any such thing. I am quite hearty. I only think of you. I know you do, Aunt, said the young lady. So the Aunt is caught up in that same ideology, right? That it, at the very least, you should be making, um, even when you're really talking about yourself and your own needs, you should make it look like what you're talking about is someone else's needs, right? Like you're sacrificing for someone else. Now, I think Lady Pole's situation is a little bit different. Why did Sir Walter marry Lady Pole? What was the primary attraction? Back around when we first met Sir Walter, what, what did he need? He needed a wife, yes, but for a particular reason. It wasn't for money, was it? That was he, it. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he needed a rich girl 
with a big dowry to help him pay off his debts, right? And it's hinted at the fact that she wasn't in great health was actually perhaps part of the attraction, right? Her mother and, Walt and, the, Sir, and Sir Walter were both kind of like apparently in a conspiracy to ignore the fact that the girl was dying of tuberculosis, right? The mother to get her married off quickly, and Sir Walter because, you know, maybe he's okay, like, you know, we get married, she doesn't hold on too long. I still get that big dowry, right? So the Poles' marriage is kind of pure financial transaction. So in a way, what's going on with the gentleman with the thistle down hair in his collecting beautiful women, right? His purposes may be more genuinely aesthetic than their husbands, but otherwise what he's doing isn't really that much different, right? Yeah, he's taking beautiful women and trapping them in a place called Lost Hope, where they're forced to dance for his pleasure every night, right? And what happens when either Lady Pole or Stephen tries to tell anyone? I can't say it. Yeah, what, what comes out is usually this kind of like seemingly rambling nonsensical narrative, right? Now all of that is going to get unraveled in the last part of the novel, right? You know, the, they'll find a way to communicate with Lady Pole to figure out what's happening. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the gentleman is treating them exactly kind of as the expectations of polite society treat them. Right? They're an adornment for his balls. Now granted, you know, his balls involve, you know, throwing people off of buildings and things like that, and people wearing dresses made of bugs. Um, but that's that whole fairy irrationality thing, right? So does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff so far? Okay, so the last piece of this that I want to try to put together today, and then we'll just finish everything up last time. I want to talk a little bit about Stephen's situation, right? So how is Stephen's situation with the gentleman different from that of the two women? Uh, the gentleman's promising him a kingdom. Yeah, the gentleman is actually promising him something, right? And actually talks to him about um, the overall situation, right? And seems to regard him as not just an acquisition, but as like a treasured companion, right? But then if we look at the way Stephen is treated by English people, It's in the chapter um, uh, Black Lad and the Blue Fellow. That ought to mean something. Right, he's picked up by this carrier after his horse dies. Page 556, yeah. Yep. And I'm looking specifically at sort of what's going on on page 564. 
Right. Despite the fact that the cost of Stephen's clothes and boots could have bought the carrier's cart and horse twice over, the carrier assumed the cheerful superiority that white generally feels for black. He considered the matter and told Stephen that the first thing they must do is arrange for the carcass to be removed. She's a valuable beast, dead or alive. Your master won't be best pleased when he finds some other fellow has got to horse into money. She was not my master's horse, said Stephen. She was mine. So what assumption does this porter automatically make about, about Stephen? That he doesn't know anything. He's a slave. Yeah. Or at the very least, that, that fine horse can't possibly be his, right? It must belong to his master. Right. A black guy wouldn't have something that nice. Hey, said the carrier, look at that. A raven had alighted on Ferenza's milk-white flank. No, cried Stephen, and moved to shoo the bird away. The carrier stopped him. Nay, lad, nay, that's lucky. I do not know when I saw a better omen. Lucky, said Stephen, what are you talking about? Tis the sign of the old king, ain't it? A raven upon summit white, old John's banner. So, <clears throat> a raven on summit white, right? There's this kind of continuing association between Stephen and the raven king. And I just wanted to draw attention to this because, you know, we'll probably draw this out a little bit near the end here, right? But I also kind of like just wanted to draw attention to the way that, you know, does it seem weird to anybody that Stephen doesn't try very hard to break out of the gentleman's grip? He makes some kind of weak protests, right? And he seems to think about Lady Pole's welfare, right? But does he ever really seem to try to um, get free from the gentleman? Why not? Why not, do you think? He's the only one that respects him. Yeah, the gentleman actually treats him with respect, right? I mean, he's turned half of Stephen's life into shit um, and um, certainly made it completely unpredictable. His day is unpredictable, right? But he also treats Stephen like someone he actually values and not like a thing. You know, he recognizes Stephen as a king, right? Not as a slave. Or, I mean, you know, as a servant. I mean, technically he's, he's a butler. He's not technically a slave anyway. But, you know, we don't really have time to draw this out today because we're running pretty into class here. But this is just something I want us to keep in mind and to sit on for next time as we wrap this up. So let me give you the reading questions for our last official non-exam meeting. We are close to the end here, people. And we'll see you all on Monday, or Wednesday. Today's Monday.